Mr. Gordon, what was Harlem like in the 1930s in terms of the culture? In 19, around the 30s, uh, the Harlem culture was, uh, as I recall, the last part of the Harlem Renaissance. This was a time when people from downtown would come up to Harlem to have a good time in what were called the night spots, such as uh, the Cotton Club, Connie's Inn. Those are the two best known. Also, though, the cultural part of Harlem stemmed from the really uh, the what they call the Renaissance, the writers and artists, but writers particularly, such as County Cullen, Claude McKay. Uh, oh, I, it's hard for me to remember sometimes some of the names, but there was a whole group of gifted writers. Oh, Langston Hughes, of course, is one of the most important. Well, that was the culture of Harlem that was generally known. Okay. Um, you mentioned the Cotton Club. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about Harlem as a playground for rich whites? The Harlem of the 20s and uh, up until the beginning of the 30s could have re really been called the playground of the rich whites because this is where they came to actually just discard their inhibitions and have a good time. They felt no compulsion to uh, control their behavior, to put it frankly. And uh, in a sense, as I recall, it seems to me that they were like the traditional wealthy nobles going among the common people, except that the common people they were going among were also uncommon people. Now, these, as you refer to them, wealthy, rich nobles, to your knowledge, would they have any other contact with the residents and people of Harlem other than coming up here and just the fun? These people that came up, actually, their contact with with uh, Harlem was almost exclusively the playground part. I mean, like the Cotton Club or Connie's Inn, they very seldom had any contact with the people of Harlem other than when they were up there. And the only people at Harlem they had contact with then were the people who were working there as waiters or the performers. Uh, of course, you know, uh, they didn't even have too many taxi drivers in Harlem that got them because they'd come from downtown. Tell me a little bit more. Tell me a little bit more about this contact with, with only waiters and, 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 and workers within the club. Why was it like that? Well, when they when the uh, when they came to Harlem, they came looking for a good time. And uh, they had known about the existence of these clubs. But in the clubs, they would see Negroes, this is what we were called in, uh, <clears throat> as their waiters, you know, and uh, various services, but nothing else. And Can we stop with this? Yeah. I was wondering whether that would get because. <laughs> Mr. Corn, you were talking about the Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was probably one of the best known night spots in the country back in the 20s. But it was a night spot and a playground for whites only. The only non-whites you would find in the Cotton Club 
were the service workers. There were no uh, customers, I mean, all the people in there to be entertained were white. Even local people, if they had the money, and not too many, of course, did, but if they had the money, they couldn't get in. Now, can you give that back to me, basically the same, th the same thing, but not make it specific to the Cotton Club? I mean, night spots in Harlem were that way? Well, you see, I, frankly, the Cotton Club and Connie's Inn were the two major spots. There were other night spots in Harlem, but they were not exclusively playgrounds for the whites. There, whites and blacks or Negroes could be found, but these were the smaller places. But the two major spots were, well, they apparently were so lucrative as businesses that the management felt that they could afford to keep the Negroes out and attract more whites. Now, <clears throat> <clears throat> We're talking about what Harlem was like in the 30s, and you just gave me the cultural stuff. What was it like in, in its relationship with the government? During the 30s, those were the days of the Depression. Uh, in fact, the Depression is generally start, considered to start around 1929 with the, the crash, as they call it. And uh, Harlem didn't, actually, the, the Depression didn't seem to make as much difference to Harlemites as it did to the other people, only because the lack of employment and the scarcity of money was hardly a new thing to the Harlemites. They were always existing at a, unfortunately, a lower economic level. Now, did the government, the people in power, in 19, well, in the early 30s, it was Jimmy Walker, and after that, uh, O'Brien for a short period, and then LaGuardia. Did they regard Harlem as part of their constituency? Did they respond to the needs of that particular community? Well, when you talk about, uh... no, let me stop that. Great. I didn't want to start it that way. Right. Uh, well, back during the Depression, Harlem was of course, a part of New York City, but the local government, as is always politically customary, will only give you as much attention as you give them support. And back in those days, the Harlem vote as a whole was not big enough or decisive enough to control any election. Therefore, I don't, I don't think that I can remember that the local government was responsive in terms of politically rewarding Harlem. They did only what they felt they had to do. And there wasn't too much impetus at that time because most of the interests, the concerns of the Negro community went beyond New York. I mean. They were interested in such things as anti-lynching and that sort of thing. Now, did you see a change in that from, from, from say, the Walker administration to the LaGuardia administration, or did things just continue as they were? No, I think the, I, I believe that uh, somewhere along the line and around that time, there came a change, but I think part of it was a reflection of what was going on in Washington. You see, when Roosevelt came in in 32, he initiated certain actions which could probably best be described as a kind of a social or sociological revolution. You know, the various the Labor Relations Act and the NRA, these were acts that uh, Roosevelt pushed through to cope with the economic situation with the Depression. I don't think that I can honestly say that he was doing this, at least in my belief, to help any specific group, Negroes, white, or anything else. He just wanted to get the whole economy going. But since it 
was impossible to improve conditions for one group without having some of it come down to another group, the uh, Negro situation was slightly improved as a result of that social revolution. And I think that that was reflected in the city government, too. Uh, for instance, Jimmy Walker uh, was a playboy. I mean, he, he was a sport and life man. And to that degree, he, didn't, uh, he wasn't any threat to the Negroes. I mean, they, the people who could play ball with him got a little taste. But it was uh, LaGuardia. When LaGuardia came along, he was uh, what I guess we'd now call a liberal. In many ways, he was more a maverick also. He said what was on his mind, and he really didn't seem to care whether it was conforming to any particular <coughs> party line or anything else. Excuse me. talking about prior to the road change differences between Jimmy Walker's administration and LaGuardia. Back at the time of the Depression, New York had also experienced the Jimmy Walker thing. I don't know how many people would remember that, but Jimmy was sporting life. When LaGuardia came in, he came in as a reformer, in a sense. And uh, little Fiorello LaGuardia, he was uh, short and stocky, and quite a, quite a, a character in a sense, you know. He was a maverick. He spoke his mind. And uh, I think, as I recall, most people felt that he was real, sincere in what he was trying to do, whether they agreed with him or not. He was no uh, great Moses leading people to freedom, but at the same time, he did not try to maintain the situation as it had existed for years before. There was a little lessening of the barriers, and uh, most people that, as I recall, thought LaGuardia was a pretty good mayor. In terms of the situation as it existed before, what was the relationship like between Harlem and the police department? I mean, we talked about Harlem and the government in particular. Tell me about Harlem and the, and the New York Police Department. The police have always uh, been a bit of a problem with Negro communities, primarily because from the outset, the police were predominantly white. Maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but the fact of the matter is that many times people put on the uniform of a policeman and somehow feel that that gives them a status more or less above that of anybody else. They are all of a sudden the sole defenders of public probity and integrity and that sort of thing. However, there always were some who were unable to let their own personal prejudices uh, not influence their attitudes so that uh, there was a tendency on the part of uh, the Harlem community to view some police with a certain amount of suspicion. This was slightly offset by the fact that at the same time, they began to get a few more Negroes into the police department. For instance, those are the days when uh, Jesse Battle, Sam Battle, became the highest ranking uh, member of the New York Police Department. 
I think he became a captain, as I recall. But you said that Harlem, in many instances, viewed the police department with suspicion. Can you be more specific? Can you give me an example? Can you tell me why? When in, in Harlem back in those days, if a policeman uh, encountered a situation where he would, uh, say, either have to intervene or make an arrest, there were occasions when, whether rightly or wrongly, he would be seen to be exercising undue force, I mean. Now, I can't honestly say that the community was always right, because it's only human. If you are doing something and somebody comes along, policeman even, and interferes with you, you resent it. Now, if the policeman feels that he has to do certain things to stop you, he's going to do it. You, in turn, are not going to be slow to say that he's being unfair. So I'm, I can't judge that all I can say is that there are any number of instances where police actions were questioned by the community on the basis that he was only doing it to us because we're not white. And, uh, but that has a situation that existed then, and I suppose it still exists. What about schools? Do you remember schools much during the Depression? What were, what were schools like up in Harlem? The schools in Harlem back in those days were pretty good. In the first place, they weren't as crowded. I accept that I suppose it's because the population wasn't as great, but they only had a regular session from nine to three. There were no half sessions as we have known later. And a great number of the teachers in Harlem, what happened? Take four, take four. Scene one, take four, camera two. Schools, we're talking about schools, Mr. Bain. The schools back in uh, the, uh, those days, uh, the 30s, in Harlem, were pretty good, as I remember them. Of course, I had finished uh, public school. In fact, yes, I'd finished my education in the early 30s. But uh, there were all nine to three. There were no half sessions. And there were quite a number of uh, Negro teachers in most of the schools. The, uh, as I remember in Harlem, the principal schools were PS 89, 135th Street, and PS 5, 140th Street. Those were for boys. 119 was for girls at 133rd Street, and there was one, at, I think, 184 down 120 something Street. These were all public schools. Wadley was a high school, and it was one of the best high schools in the city. That was 116th Street now, for girls. Now, did the community participate in schools? Were they active and very supportive of the schools? I mean, the surrounding community, do you remember? I, rem I remember back in those days that uh, there was a great deal of parent activity and parent interest in the schools. And I think that's one of the reasons why the schools seem to uh, get do better. There was parent activity and parent interest, more so, I think, than perhaps later. We want to change up here and uh, talk about FDR. <laughs> 1929 stock market crashes, um, 32 election, FDR versus Hoover. FDR wins in a huge landslide. Now, what? He comes into office and the, and the country has great, great problems. Do you remember his first fireside chat? <laughs> 
I, uh, I remember when FDR was elected in, 30, in November 32, and it was in March 4th, 1933, that he actually was installed or inaugurated, as they say. He started off his fireside chats. I can't remember exactly when, but I know I used to hear most of them. And uh, what I remember about them mostly is that this was where he worked his charm. He was at his best in really charming the whole country with his fireside chats. What do you mean charming the country? I mean... When you listen to the fireside chat and when he finished, you might not have been able to say particularly everything that he was talking about, but you had the feeling that, oh, everything is going to be better. That's why I said it was charm. It wasn't necessarily accomplishment. It was charm. Scene one, take five, camera roll, O3. Mr. Bourne, what was the general feeling of blacks towards FDR? Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a rare politician in that his success was his charm. He knew how to manipulate people. And this includes the Negro community as well as every other. From the time that he was elected, as I remember, he, everything he did was viewed as, well, he's helping us. Nobody ever raised a question as to whether it was designed to help us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the Negroes. But uh, a certain amount of it did come through, because what he did was engineer what I think they would now call a social revolution. He, for instance, I mean, he was responsible for pushing through this legislation, uh, you know, the Labor Relations Act and NRA, and uh, then he created these various agencies, the WPA and things like that, to provide some kind of employment for people during the Depression. It was supposed to help everybody. And if it helped everybody, it helped uh, some of the Negroes, too. So to that's your, why they thought he was a pretty good guy. To your knowledge, was there any racism or discrimination within those works programs? As I recall, <clears throat> however, the programs could not possibly escape the practices which had existed as long as the United States existed, I mean. There were always people within those programs who operated them in accordance with their own personal feelings, and some of those personal feelings included a belief that Negroes weren't entitled to as much as anybody else. This created, of course, uh, a number of protests the whole New Deal, or whatever you want to call it, was not by any means a pure attack upon uh, discrimination or bias or race uh, hatred. No, it was an economic movement which brought with it, of course, certain advances but did not necessarily shake off all of the ills of the American society. Okay. We want to move on now to the Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign. Can you tell me what were the circumstances that led to it? Back in... Uh, Back in the 30s, Harlem <clears throat> was a Negro community which existed by shopping at stores which were white-owned. <clears throat> the... Do you need some water? 
I guess it might help. Just, we'll just continue to grow. Yes. I'd like to start that all over again. Yes, in Harlem around the 1930s, uh, the, the community's shopping area was 125th Street. That was the major shopping area for Harlem. The stores there sold everything from furniture to groceries to practically everything. But the stores there were all owned by whites, and they also, their staff, sales staff, and the whole visible staff was all white. So there was a group, a small group of men who suddenly decided that something had to be done about it. They organized something called, as I recall it, the Harlem Labor Union. And they started a campaign in Harlem telling people that we should have those jobs. Why should we not, why should all the white people come in here, get those jobs, and then go home and take the money out of Harlem? This gave rise to a slogan, don't buy where you can't work. And it also triggered a campaign that went on for a few years. Now, who were the people, you said a group of men, but can you be a little more specific and tell me some of the people that led this, this group? Yeah, group? Some of the, yeah, I remember some of the, uh, some of the men that were, were the leaders, the original leaders in that don't buy where you can't work thing. Uh, there was a man named Ira Kemp. There was, uh, well, the one I remember mostly was a colorful figure who was known as Sufi Abdul Hamid. Sufi Abdul Hamid was the name he was always known by, but I happen to remember very dimly that, I don't remember his real name, but I know he came out of Georgia originally. However, Sufi adopted the turban and the robes of uh, the Arabs, and uh, he began to be very well known and eventually to be very thoroughly hated by the white merchants because he was a, an imposing figure. He was a pretty husky man, and he adopted a facial scowl most of the time, which was somewhat intimidating, so that uh, Sufi long before the Muslims of today had established in the minds of those white store owners a negative attitude. Can you tell me about Reverend Johnson and Adam Clay Powell's involvement in the Don't Buy campaign? The, uh, that, uh, the, the, uh, that campaign about don't buy where you can't work very soon attracted the attention of a number of local ministers, uh, chief among them being uh, the Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., I mean the young minister of Abyssinian Baptist Church, and Reverend John H. Johnson, who was an Episcopal minister at St. Martin's Church. That was 122nd Street and Lenox Avenue. I know John. I knew both of them. In fact, John H. Johnson was a minister who performed my marriage, and uh, <clears throat> they uh, associated themselves with the movement as uh, ministers. They had a congregation. They had people to follow them. It also, I think, gave a certain amount of uh, credibility to the movement over and above what they would have had just from these organizers in the streets. As a matter of fact, that campaign did much to project Adam Powell into the political arena. So did the church become the driving force behind the campaign? The church became, began, became a supporting force behind the campaign. I don't think uh, that it would be fair to say that the churches uh, became the major driving force because Kemp, Sufi, and the rest of those fellows never dropped out of it entirely. They were always up there, and they were very active. And although there, were, there may have been times when people may have been critical of some of the actions they took, overall, I think they have to be given credit for not only launching the movement, but sustaining it. So this Don't Buy Where You Can't Work campaign didn't work? Was it successful? It was ultimately, I think, quite successful. In the beginning, 
a few of the merchants began to cave in a bit and uh, resorted to what would be the normal way. They would hire a Negro and put them out front in the sales force. This was, of course, what we now call tokenism. It wasn't enough, however, because the people were becoming aroused. And in addition, uh, conditions were still bad. So the net result was that there developed a real split between the community and the 125th Street merchants. Do you remember pickets and demonstrations or any events in regard to the campaign that stand out in your mind? Well, the campaign uh, really developed steadily and one of the things that became a regular thing were pickets. They paraded with picket signs in front of various stores, sometimes up and down the whole block. Sometimes they'd pick out a certain store to focus on it. And they would wear these signs, don't buy where you can't work. They also used to hand out leaflets at the subway stations, and they uh, did everything that they knew that they could do to propagandize throughout Harlem. This, I think, helped to build up the feeling a feeling which had a very violent climax. Can you tell me about that climax? That violent climax that I mentioned was the Harlem riots of 1935, not March 19th, 1935. And I will always remember it because I was with the New York Age then as a city editor, and we were in the position of being the first paper to discover the riot. And it was something, I think I'd like to tell you about it. May Please I? Please do. I think we should start another okay. call because we're going to run out in just a minute. Uh -huh. Can you tell me about the conditions that led to the Harlem riot? In, uh, back in the early 30s and middle 30s, the Harlem community was receding under, under, the, under the surface. You had to be there to really be aware, but feelings were running very high. The don't buy where you can't work campaign was going full steam, but the success was not going as fast as people wanted it to. They weren't getting the jobs, and uh, most people seemed to believe that the white merchants were determined not to give in, which of course intensified their anger. One of the things that I will never forget was in March of 1935, I was a city editor of the New York Age at the time, and uh, the riot was on March 19th. But to me, I like to tell this story because not too many people probably can remember it. The star of Green Pastures had died the previous week the man that played, Richard B. Harrison, who played the Lord in Green Pastures. He had a big funeral at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine. We, of course, covered it and took pictures. The Age went to press on a Tuesday night. Like most of the uh, weeklies, they'd go to press in the middle of the week, although they were dated the succeeding Saturday. We were supposed to be on the stands on Wednesday. Well, we were all set. We knew with the, the Richard B. Harrison funeral was going to be the front page feature with a big picture. And uh, because it had happened over the weekend, our copy was prepared early. So it was around 2, 2, 2.30 or thereabouts on Tuesday afternoon, we were ready to lock up. As I think I may have told you, the press was downstairs, the age, the only Negro paper in the city that had its own press on premises. <laughs> 
But we had a young would-be reporter, and I remember his name, Eddie O'Neill. I think he lived in the Bronx. He had been around, hanging around with us for several months, and we were get, bringing him along. He was learning pretty well. He was restless, as kids would be, I suppose. And I'm saying that although I was just a few years older than he was. He said, well, nothing else to do. He's going to just go out and see what's happening. And about 10 minutes later, the phone rang, and this was Eddie O'Neill. He says, I'm down on 125th Street, and there's a riot starting. I said, come on, Eddie, come on. He said, no, it's really a riot. So I promptly called down to the press room where the managing editor, Ludlow Werner, and told him, Eddie said something about a riot on 125th Street. I better check it to make sure. So he said he'd hold it rather than run. So I went down to 125th Street. We were at 135th, so it's only 10 blocks away. As I got to the corner of 7th Avenue and 125th Street, the crowd started surging up, breaking windows. There was a riot starting. There were just a few policemen, and they were trying to keep out of sight because this crowd was really on the rampage. So I tried to find out what was happening, and finally I got from several people a story that in, I think it was Woolworths, I'm, I think it was Woolworths or Chris, one of those department stores, a kid whose name was Lino Rivera. They said that he had been caught stealing from the counter, and the manager and a couple of people had taken him down in the basement and beaten him to death. The crowd believed this, and they were mad. They were surging up and down 125th Street from 8th Avenue over to probably Madison Avenue. And then they went up and down a couple of the avenues, Lenox and 7th, a few blocks. That riot started around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and it began to peter out around 3 a.m. But it was a very interesting thing for me because once we had established it, I went on back, I told Eddie to keep calling. I went back to the office, and we promptly broke down page one to leave a column, and Eddie would call in pieces, and we'd put together a story and I think it was around 6 o'clock in the evening, we had copies of an extra down on 125th Street selling it to the rioters. In the meantime, the, the dailies, having heard about it, sent reporters up. The reporters found their way to the New York Age office. And they made that their headquarters because they were all white. And the temper of the crowd was such that they admitted they were afraid to go out into it. So what they did was stay there. When I got the reports from our people, we had some other people by that time around, and I would feed them, and then they would get on the phone and phone it down to the papers. So that we were, in a sense, a press service for New York's daily newspapers on the Harlem riot. In fact, most of them got their lead from our first extra. But uh, there's another part to this. Along around... 2 p.m., 2 a.m., I got a call from Jesse Battle down at the 28th Precinct, which was 123rd Street on the west side. He said they had found the boy. He wasn't dead. So I hurried down there. By that time, we, a few, some of the white reporters went with me. We went down there. Lino Rivera was a youngster. I guess he must, may have been about 14. I'm not sure how old he was. These people apparently had caught him trying to pilfer a little something from the. They took him out the back door and told him, go home. But the people didn't know this. And he was home in bed while these people were riding up in the street to avenge his death. It was quite a thing. But now tell me, was Nino Rivera just the incident? Was this riot going to happen, and that was just the thing that set it off? I have always felt that that riot was due to happen. Lino merely happened to be the trigger. He was the detonator in this particular case.
But if he hadn't been there, they would, we'd have had to invent something. There was going to be a riot because that was the temper of the community. And it was heading in that direction. But of course, that is when I think that I can say it was a turning point that made that campaign really successful. Because after that riot, there wasn't a storekeeper in 120th Street that would have dared to try to hold out. As a matter of fact, the mayor appointed a committee to investigate, and they subsequently reported a few months later, as is the case, what everybody knew, that there was discrimination in employment on 125th Street. What happened with that report? I mean, was there, did the government take any action? Oh, yes. The government, what did they do? The government did take action. They, they uh, oh. in their own way, uh, helped to persuade these uh, employers that they'd better hire some people, and then they began to hire Negroes in their stores. And if, once they had uh, enough Negroes in the stores to, for the people to see them, the anger gradually began to uh, decrease, and people were going back in there to buy. But for a long time, they insisted on seeing some Negro salespeople before they would buy. As I remember that report, one of the things that they said led to the riot was housing conditions. Now, did the government do anything in regard to housing conditions in Harlem? Well, uh, it's, let me see now. There were a number of other results from that riot. I'm thinking about the Harlem River housing. That was, I think that's the Metropolitan... I think the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company was the first one. Yes, that was one of the results also. The uh, well, housing conditions in Harlem, uh, like uh, any uh, community where the local residents don't have too much to say about it, were horrible. I mean, you know, landlords are landlords, regardless of race, creed, or color, as a matter of fact. They take advantage of a situation. But uh, there was a need for housing, and uh, Metropolitan Life, as I recall, was one of the earliest to set up uh, housing. But of course, even then, that was not as uh, pure a, an effort as one would like to think, because what Metropolitan Life had done, they had created a housing complex downtown for whites. And then they created the Metro, the Opa Harlem River houses. I don't mean uh, the low rent project. Uh, this was the first. What do they call it? I'm trying to remember the name of it, and I don't. But it was a house. It was a housing complex for Negroes up in Harlem. I have two more questions for you. Uh, did LaGuardia come? I think you're going to have to pick that up. Okay. <laughs> two more questions. Two, two more, more questions. Row. Did LaGuardia come where? <laughs> Moving on to Cape 7, Camelot 5, Simon Cameron. Mr. Vaughn, can you tell me more about the riots, particularly more detail about what you actually saw and how you think people actually felt as they're out there? That riot is something I don't think I will ever forget. When I first got down there, this was the first time I had seen what was really a mob scene. There were, the street was filled from, it was almost wall-to-wall -wall people. And they were angry to the point where you could see that if you got in their way, they didn't care who you were, you were in trouble. I saw people actually picking up bricks and stones and throwing them at the store windows to break them. They were in a destructive mood, and it was one of those things that I was... Frankly, I wasn't too happy and too, I was a little afraid myself because even though I, most of the people knew me by sight because after all they know the local newspaper people. But at that particular time, if you got in their way, they didn't care who you were. They were mad at the whole street. And they were shouting, all kinds of things. And they were destructive. 
it was really, they were trying to destroy because they were venting their anger. That's what it seemed to me. And it was really something that I will never forget because it's the first time I'd ever been in a riot like that. Now, you, you go to press, the paper comes out. How did the government respond? Did LaGuardia come to Harlem? Not that night. I never saw him that night. Did he come with any time within the next couple of days? Do you know? I'm tr uh, what, I, what I'm trying to remember is if LaGuardia made any personal, if he made any personal appearances in Harlem in connection with the riot, it was a few days afterwards, if at all. And it wasn't uh, like trying to calm the people or speak to the people. He would appear, say, at a meeting, of, say, the, co the committee he uh, appointed. But uh, I don't think that I recall LaGuardia. It may have been, but I don't recall him appearing in Harlem as a, you know, trying to calm things down himself. I don't recall that. This is the final question. Did FDR's New Deal programs, I'm talking about the New Deal, not the, uh, the stuff that happened after 35, I mean after 36, after the second election, I'm talking about the New Deal, CWA, PWA, yeah. NRA, those kinds of things. Did they represent any significant change in terms of the, the government's relationship to people, particularly uh, in, in terms of the government's responsibility to the people? When we, when people start talking about FDR's uh, first actions when he entered the presidency in coping with the Depression, because that's what they were as far as I understand it, uh, everything he did brought about some changes, but these were changes in terms of uh, stimulating or creating employment for people. It was sometimes made employment, like, uh, what was it, the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, that was. That was probably a precursor to the Peace Corps, except that it was in this country. CCC was an organization where they took young, young fellows, particularly, uh, unemployed at loose ends, and uh, set them up, usually out in other parts of the country doing One, take eight, camera roll five. Take eight. Well, when, when Roosevelt's New Deal, uh, when he started his uh, attempts to bring us out of the recession, he created a number of agencies. And uh, since then, of course, one has to wonder what was the net effect. I remember at that time that they, uh, created employment for people, sometimes with made employment. And because of that widespread effect, it helped all people, not just any one group, but it only opened the doors for them. If you try, at least as far as I'm concerned, if you try to assess Roosevelt's impact, I would say, no, that's not what you want. I'm going to stop again. I think that oh, that. The point to say what you, you said, uh, what you want me to say. You also said depression. You said re re recession as opposed to depression. Oh, that's a recession. No, you, yeah, you said. Oh, oh. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> The depression. depression. Well, that's what it was. Not recession. Um, I better stop. <coughs> when FDR's uh, actions to uh, get us out of the depression created jobs, it also brought about what I always call the beginnings of the social revolution. And this did have an effect, I believe, on the Negro community because it brought about certain changes, opened certain doors that had never been opened before. But it only opened the doors. It was something that could only continue if the Negro community itself was willing 
to take further action and keep pushing because I frankly am unwilling to say that FDR was necessarily going to lead a charge through the doors. All he did was open them. It was up to us as people to get through and keep things going. What about us as people, I mean, beyond just black people, what about us as people, us as Americans, to push the government to respond to our need? Talk to me about that. When I say us as people, of course, I mean uh, I was talking about the Negroes. Actually, the whole program was opening doors to a certain extent for all people. And uh, when I say it was up to the people to go through the doors to take advantage of it, I guess it would apply to all people. However, I have to throw this in. Nothing there necessarily was going to automatically eliminate or abolish or even diminish the prejudices which seem to be a part of human nature. So I don't think we could realistically expect the white community to push as vigorously for the equal attainment of the benefits to the Negroes. It was up to the Negroes to do that. But everybody could have benefited. That's why I call it a social revolution. And do you see um, any fundamental change in terms of the government becoming more involved and in responding to the needs of people? Like Hoover just sat back and had this wait and see attitude, uh, which was sort of prevalent prior, even in, in administrations prior to his. But Roosevelt, I think, um, was a person of action, and he moved the government to a different realm of responsibility. If you feel that that's true, can you talk to me about it? I believe that Franklin Roosevelt and his whole effort did deepen the sense of responsibility of the government. As a matter of fact, I think you will find that uh, some of his opponents used that as a major criticism, that the government was taking over and not letting private enterprise run things as they always had. And that last part is one of the best reasons why I disagree with them. They always had run them, and we weren't getting anywhere. Audio rolled out. Audio rolled out. Changing to sound roll three, page 10, camera roll five. Um, in, uh, in FDR's uh, actions, his actions to get us out of depression, he did a lot of things I call a social revolution. Now, blacks were not necessarily included as a specific uh, beneficiary because these programs were for all people. And uh, what those programs did, as far as I can see, FDR, he made a big crack in the social situation in this country. But he couldn't do much more than that. It was up to the people to widen that crack and to bring about the eventual solution of the social problems which they faced. Give it to me again, looking this way. Basically the same thing. Okay. You approach. Huh? You gotta do it quick because we're running Oh yeah, running out of time. No, the whole thing you want again? Yeah. <laughs> as much as we can get done. As much as we can get done, all right. Um, FDR's uh, actions when he was uh, trying to cope with the Depression brought about a kind of a social revolution, but it was not something that was specifically for blacks or any specific group. It was for all people. And uh, that whole program did make a substantial crack in the system. But... That's all he could do. He couldn't do any more than that. It was up to the people to widen that crack and to bring, go through it and bring about the eventual solution of the social problems which everybody faced. <laughs>
new camera roll, take 11, camera roll 6. When one starts to assess uh, Franklin Roosevelt's uh, social revolution, I think it has to be kept in mind that blacks were not necessarily included as a group, a special beneficiary of those programs. Uh, they were for everybody. And uh, what FDR did was to make a nice big crack in our social system. But that's all he could do. It was up to the people to enlarge that crack and thus make it possible to go on and bring about the eventual solution of the social problems which confronted us. You like that, huh? Okay. Take 12, camera roll six. FDR's New Deal program was not specifically designed for Negroes alone. It was designed for everybody. And uh, I think that's the way it worked. But it, all he could do was make a crack in the system that he was dealing with. He couldn't do any more than that. I think it was up to the people, all of us, to move forward, enlarge the crack, and hopefully be able to go through and hopefully to solve, which hasn't yet been solved, the social problems that still confront us. Take 13, camera roll 6. Me? Can you tell me? Um, can you tell me a little bit about what you know about Walter White and uh, and his activities with the with lynching and the NAACP and how that all got started and how he got involved in it? Walter White was uh, he got with the NAACP because of Walter White, who was probably the best known of the earliest executive secretaries of the NACP originally went to work for him as a field man in the South. And the reason they hired him was because he looked like White. And his assignment was to circulate and as often as possible become a witness to lynchings. He more often than most people knew, was able to mingle with the lynch crowds because he looked white and he could see. And this way he gained a great deal of first-hand information. He could attest to what went on and about the lynchings. So he became very important to the NAACP. And that's one of the biggest reasons why he became the executive secretary. And I think that should explain why he, the NAACP's major interest was in lynching. Okay, I'm gonna ask you about that, that last part that we were talking about, um, because it's a puzzle me. It's, we're talking about the Depression now, the 30s. There's a lot of issues confronting the black Americans. You know, these, economic issues, there's discrimination. Why, of all the issues, do you, do you feel that lynching, the anti-lynching law, became the passionate, devoted issue on the NAACP agenda, on Walter White's agenda? Well, in the first place, I've, uh, oh, strike it. In, uh, around that time, lynching had become one of the horrible things that was happening throughout the South. It was murder. It was also one something, the kind of a thing that's most easily understood. 
by people, so it, be, it would be a very, it would seem like a very good thing to make as a major uh, target. And as I said, I think before, White came into the NACP as the expert on lynching. Okay. How did, how did this, how did this, you know, the, how did this affect, this issue affect the people up in Harlem? Um, you know, most of the lynching was happening in the South. People were pretty far removed from it. How did, first of all, how did, how did Harlemites become aware of, of, of how, of this going on, and how did they respond to that as an issue for themselves? Well, although lynching was uh, predominantly in the South, and I say predominantly, it was not completely and exclusively in the South, but it was most of it was done in the South. But uh, the reports coming up one way or another, either through the press or through witnesses, uh, made most of the uh, blacks in the North, I know in New York, they were well aware of these things going on. And you have to remember also that although there were blacks in the north and blacks in the south. They weren't separate. They were, as a matter of fact, there was a f family relationship there. In most instances, they, most of them had people in the south, families in the south. I dare say that in more than one instance, a person who was lynched in the south had relatives in New York. So it was a direct uh, relationship which uh, was of concern. And of course, on top of that, the NACP, to the degree that they were able, used publicity to keep this before the public eye. How did they publicize it? What, how did they well, the NACP had a number of ways of doing it. They used the Negro Press, as it was called then, but they also had a regular, what they call a news service. The NACP put out weekly uh, uh, news stories and sent them, circulated them not only to the Negro Press, but to the daily press. And occasionally some of them would get into the daily press too. Now let me ask you some more about the NAACP. Um, was it perceived, how did people perceive the NAACP in, in, in Harlem, in the black community? Were they aware of it? Uh, did it affect their lives? Did they think it was an effective organization or was it just a symbolic, was it just a symbolic thing for them? It, it, in New York, back in uh, back in the earlier days, the NACP was regarded as a, not as a symbol. It was an organization, but the problems that they concerned themselves with were, admittedly, perhaps not as close to the blacks in New York as they were to blacks in other parts of the country. And I think one has to remember that although the NACP headquarters was in New York, they had branches all over the country, that the real strength of the NACP was not necessarily in New York, it was those branches all throughout the country. That's where their power always has been. And what were they doing at the time? What, was the NDA, what were those branches and what was the NAACP The doing? branches were all together in this NACP campaign against lynching primarily. That was the first order of business. Now why why do you think that they why do you think that ultimately they didn't get an anti lynching bill passed? Why didn't that happen? They tried and they tried. Well, they got an anti lynching bill passed, but it took a long time and the biggest reason was that the southern congressmen and the southern senators, all of whom at that particular time enjoyed seniority, which meant that they headed various committees. They were in position to block anti-lynching legislation, to derail it, or even when it began to get more support, their last uh, resort was a filibuster. That's what got in the way of the anti-lynching legislation, the southern, support, uh, southern opposition. Now, FDR, for example, privately... Here, Bob, just a little, a little too far off. To my left? Yeah. FDR privately to Walter White implied that he supported a federal anti-lynch law, but he never, he never came out and supported it uh, publicly. Why do you suppose he didn't? Why do you suppose he didn't do that? And do you think he was being hypocritical, or 
I would I would say that FDR was being political, not hypocritical. FDR, you must remember, was a Democratic president. He was the head of the Democratic Party. The Democrats had what we call the Solid South. He could the, they could always count on the South supporting a Democratic candidate for president. If FDR had gone public at that time in opposing, I mean supporting anti-lynching legislation, he would have faced a, a rebellion from his solid constituency in the South. Seven. Now, the fact that there wasn't an anti-lynch law, federal anti-lynch law passed, um, would you therefore consider that the whole anti-lynching campaign was a failure? The, when, the fact that uh, a federal anti-lynching law was not passed was hardly uh, reason to claim that the campaign was a failure because ultimately they were able to outlaw it. It just didn't happen at that particular time. And, uh, but I don't think it would be fair to say that the campaign was a failure by any means. As a matter of fact, if the NACP had not kept on and persisted, it might have been much later before they were able to get that little passed. I've heard the NAACP referred to as a middle-class organization. Is that true? And if so, what do you think they mean by that? Well, the NAACP, at the, in later years, may have been referred to as a middle-class organization. I don't know whether you're discussing it in terms of back in the 30s or... In the 30s. Well, in the 30s, I don't think you could anybody would really have thought of it as a middle-class organization because the bulk of the NAACP membership was outside of New York and in these small towns or not so small towns and particularly, ironically enough, throughout the South because that's where such an organization had the biggest meaning and that's where you will find a great, if anybody was, were able to do the research, you'd find that the majority of the real heroes of NAACP were in the South, where it was much more dangerous to be a member. That's great. Um, now, Jews were instrumental in starting up the NAACP, and they were, um, they were active in it even, even throughout the 30s. Why do you think that there was such a strong Jewish participation in that organization? The... Uh, the history of the relationship between Jews and Negroes goes way back. There are strong parallels, as I see it, in their experiences in this country. The one exception, of course, being that I suppose any Jew who might wish to could sidestep a good deal of discrimination merely by not admitting the Jewish faith. A Negro could not deny his racial identity. The Jews also were much, uh, much more experienced. They have a background of uh, experience in organization. The Jews also were very strong in labor organization, particularly in New York. And uh, so they would welcome and would encourage the support of any other groups to help swell whatever they were doing. Also, I like to believe, because uh, it's my own personal experience, that there were a number of Jews who actually were moved by a sincere interest, you know, in trying to improve the lot of the Negro because they felt a kinship with them. 
Um, did black, and again, I'm thinking of the people in the community, did, did, did uh, the Negroes in the community at the time, did they resent the participation of Jews in the NAACP? Because, you know, you talked earlier about the Don't Buy or You Can't Work campaign, and a lot of those stores were Jewish. Uh, so there was, there was perhaps some resentment towards Jews on the one hand, yet then the Jews are also in the NAACP and, and, and moving things along in that way. This black-Jewish uh, relationship can create some puzzling uh, problems because, as, uh, as you have, may have pointed out, on one side of the fence you had the store owners in 125th Street, a number of them, most of them were Jewish. Well, this was just because apparently they were, the kind, they were inclined towards that kind of entrepreneurship. Now, it is true that the uh, don't buy where you can't work did create animosity and against the store owners who happened to be Jewish. But somehow, that never jumped across to the NAACP in the sense that the Jews who were very active in helping to get the NAACP going, that there was no, uh, they didn't link the two somehow. I'm, I can't explain it any better than that. I mean, it was not a question of a universal anti-Semitism or anything like that. Those Jews that were working with Negroes or with blacks were fine. Those who were identified in a situation where they were considered to be a part of something that was disadvantageous to blacks, they were not fine. Okay, great. Okay, let's um, we'll move on to we'll move on to, to Joe Lewis now. Can you um, can you try to sort of go back and recall for us what it would be like, you know, in Harlem or where you lived when uh, you know in Joe's heyday in the third? I'm thinking we're still in the thirties now. Um, on the day of a fight, how would people, um, how would people anticipate, did, did people anticipate it and what would they do when the fight, during the fight and, and if he won afterwards? How, how, how did the community respond? Well, when Joe Lewis came into the boxing scene, he quickly generated adulation because he was good. He was a very good fighter, and he could seem to be able to beat anybody he faced. So, uh, in a sense, he became a, something of an idol. And, and it, whenever he was having a fight, whether it was in New York, as it often was, or any place else, there was al always a, a lot of eager anticipation. People expected him to win. In other words, it was just waiting another victory for our boy. With one sad exception. The first smelling fight. That was a bitter disappointment in Harlem, as I remember, because people that couldn't go to the fight, and most of them didn't get to the fight, they listened to it on the radio. The night that he fought smelling the first time, and Schmeling finally beat him. Whereas the fight ended, you could almost feel it. Uh, I can't say it was a moan, uh, you know, a lamenting, but there was a feeling in the air. Everybody was really let down. It was, a, it was almost like a funereal uh, air that descended on Harlem. And, uh, by the next morning, people were going around as if they'd lost their last friend. Joe had been beaten. It was hard to believe. But it was very shortly afterwards when they found out that Joe was going to be able to get a fight with him again, instinctively everybody began to say, well, you'll get him this th next time. So they got over it. Well, what, what was it? And even before he had the second Schmeling fight, yeah. he managed to to manipulate things so that he fought Braddock and he won the world's championship. Yeah. How did uh, how did folks in the community respond when when, when he won the champion and the title? 
Oh, it was Christmas, New Year's, every holiday all boiled into one. They were actually dancing in the streets that night. Because you must remember, when he took the title from Braddock, it was the first time that a black man had become champion since Jack Johnson. Um, did you ever go to a Joe Lewis fight? Were you ever at any Joe Lewis fights? Oh, if yes, you were, huh? And if you were, what, 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 did, what did it feel like to be at a Joe Lewis well, fight? Well, in the first place, when I was at the fights, most of the time I was a sports editor, so I was in the press room. As a matter of fact, I always remember, I was one of those at the, uh, the second smelling fight. I almost turned my head and missed it myself. He went after him so fast. Yeah, I was at a number of his fights as, as a sports writer, and I was also at his training camp a number of times. Was there any, was there any segregation or in, at the fights themselves? I mean, did, was there any separate seating or any? No, in the first place, the fights that I was at was all in, all in New York, you know, the Yankee Stadium or Madison Square Garden, place like that. No segregation. Yeah, matter of fact, it would have been suicidal for the promoter to tried it. Um, so then, it get, then I get to the point of, you know, we talked about Walter White, there are other people, you know, Mr. Randolph, there were all kinds of black politicians, when I say politicians, people organizing for the betterment of their people. Um, Today we call them activists. Okay, activists, thank you. Um, Academicians, there were all kinds yeah. of people. Why Joe Lewis? Why was Joe Lewis the guy who captured the imagination of the people? Why was he the hero? He seemed to be the hero of the 30s. Why a boxer? As opposed to well, now, I don't think it is quite accurate to put it that way. It may have seemed that way. Joe Lewis occupied a position that was unique, but he was by no means the biggest hero for Negroes or black people in those days. He was their athletic idol. He was the representative of men who by force could beat anybody that stood up against him. Sorry, but we, we uh, ran out of film just a second ago. Okay. So we didn't so let's just stick it. Take 15, sound roll 3134, camera roll 8. Okay, so we were talking, let's start again with talking about why Joe Lewis was such a hero to people. Why, why this boxer was such a hero. Joe Lewis was something of an idol to his fellow, but he was not, in a sense, uh, the big leader or the big hero, the most important black man. Joe was more uh, a symbol of athletic prowess, of strength. He was, in a sense, doing what uh, maybe the average black man would like to have done, beat any white man that he had to fight. That, I think, was more what Joe represented. Because you, the, the, it would be inaccurate to think of Joe in the same terms as you think of people like A. Philip Randolph, Walter White, uh, W.B. Du Bois, Walt, uh, Wilkins, you know. No, he was not in, on that level at all. He was an idol, but he's more like uh, the present-day athletes. Mm -hmm. Nobody thinks of them as anything but super athletes or supermen in the sense of physical but, achievement. But the people loved him in a way that they didn't love Walter White. Or I mean, I don't think the people like. I mean, they were dancing in the streets around him. They were dancing in the streets not because they loved him. They were dancing in the streets because of his victory, not him. He was just the one that gave them a reason to dance in the streets. But you, I think you have to be careful there and not think that Joe became the sainted idol of all the Negro race. Because there were some people, some blacks, who uh, said, well, he's a good fighter, but so what's a fighter, you know? Okay. Um, going back to Schmeling a little bit, and we talked about this some on the phone, and we'll see if there's, if there's anything to this. Was there much made when, when Joe Lewis fought either in the first or in the second or both? Was there much made of the fact that Schmeling was a German and was a Nazi? And was there much rallying around? Uh... Well, you have to remember that was the early 30s. Uh, 
this was a time when Hitler was more or less in his ascendancy. Now, the linking of Schmeling and Joe and the into, into uh, I'm trying to get the right word, the bringing in uh, the fact that Schmeling was a German and a Nazi had nothing to do with the black people. This was done by the white media. And it was, I suspect, I always felt that it was encouraged by the government, the federal government, which was quite busily building up anti-Nazi propaganda. Okay. Now, but you did say in your, in your earlier conversation with Dante that you felt that perhaps after the first Schmeling fight, maybe that did more than anything to solidify black feeling against Nazis. Do you think? Well, to a certain degree, there are a number of things that would help to do that. You must remember there's Jesse Owens going over in 36 to the Olympics and winning everything in sight, but then he was reported being snubbed every time by Hitler. That was part of it, too. And you must remember that blacks are Americans, too, in the sense that they are susceptible to American media. They could read and hear all of the propaganda that was being pushed out on the American people against Hitler, I think rightfully well, myself. Then let me ask you something. Do you think that Joe Lewis was being, in a sense, being used by the, by the American media and by the government and by the, 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 the establishment to promote a point of view? Do you think he was being But of used? course. He was there. Okay, can the you start that as a whole sentence? You know, with, with oh, yes. Actually, uh, the, uh, the, the bringing in of Schmeling's Nazi connections uh, in connection with Joe and his fights was nothing more or less than a realization, as I see it, by the American government that here was a handy situation which they turned to their account. They, in other words, to the degree you can say that they were using the whole situation, using Joe and everything else to help their propaganda effort along. Joe had really nothing to do with that, per se. Okay. Can we cut for a second? Cut. Um, talk a little bit about Eleanor Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt's relation to the to, to, to black people and black people's relationship to her. How do people feel about her and, and how was she perceived at that time? Now again we're talking about in the depression. Eleanor Roosevelt was generally well regarded as a gracious lady and a fine woman. In fact I would say that many people liked Eleanor better than they liked FDR. She made it a point to get out and get around so that she got to know a whole lot of black people and a whole lot of black people had some contact with her at one time or another. That's not to mean that she had everybody was her warm friends, but they all, at least, they knew her. And whenever she had anything to say, as far as the blacks were concerned, she said it right. Did you ever meet her? Oh, yes. Uh, it was impossible not to meet Eleanor because she was always every place. When I say I met her, that doesn't mean that she would ever have remembered me because I was just one of a Do number of people. Do you have any people. particular moment or, or occasion that you remember of meeting, coming into contact with Eleanor? Uh, no, actually, the, the, I, yes, I, have a, I, I wasn't coming into contact with her, but this I can say. At one time, she and Mary McLeod Bethune, whom I don't know if you know of her. She and Eleanor occasionally would be appearing someplace together. And photographers, that was a real problem. Because Eleanor was white and Mary McLeod was very black. 
And in those days, you had to expose for one or the other. It was not easy to get them in the same picture without one of them suffering from the exposure. Okay, now we'll just our last, the last question. We'll talk about uh, Jesse Owens and, and what do you remember of his, of what his victories meant. Um, particularly, it was only a couple months before that Joe had lost to Max Schmeling. So what did his victories mean to the black community and, uh, and, to, and to America as a whole? And to, and to, you know, to, to all of America? And, uh, and, the, and the feeling about Nazism in Germany. Sir, can I just have you move to Well, I knew Jesse Owens, of course. Like, uh, yeah, I met him. I mean, I was covering sports, among other things, at the time. I didn't go over to Germany. Another fellow was over there with him. But uh, his victories were played up back here, the, the black press played them up as victories for a black man, just like they would have played up uh, Joe Lewis. The white press played it up as a victories by an American over the Nazis. Now, just how much the black community bought from the media, the white media, I don't, I can't say. But Jesse Owens was just another athlete who had the admiration of the black people because of his victories. He was good. But didn't it mean for him, in the same way that it was for, you know, Joe Lewis became accepted by white people as a champion, and so did Jesse Owens. Did, did that mean something to black people, that here is, you know, okay, one of our own is being accepted by, by the white folks? Does that, does that have any...? Not... The, 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 both Joe Lewis and Jesse Owens may have appeared to have been accepted by the white people. They were accepted, really, just in terms of their accomplishments. But neither Joe nor Jesse gained too much from it. Joe, as you may know, later on, had financial difficulties because, as far as the black community was concerned, even the IRS didn't give him a break that they thought he deserved. Jesse Owens, by the way, also, I met him again years ago, years later in, in Chicago when he had a, I guess it was a PR firm, a consulting firm. Jesse wasn't doing too well either because as you, they say that he was accepted by the whites, but he wasn't rewarded by the whites. Not really. Okay, we got a little more time? Let's try that again about, and just succinctly, after he came, after Jesse Owens' victory, yeah. he came back, he was, he may have been accepted, but not rewarded. Yeah, well, when Jesse Owens uh, hung up all his victories in Germany, he came back, he was a hero to America, you know. But uh, he was viewed by the whites as, he was great because he had won for America. But he never was really rewarded by the whites in the sense that most people think of rewards in this country. They never made things any easier for him. And I don't think he profited financially very much either. I seem to remember some years later, he was at one time racing horses. I mean, he was running against a horse. And for an Olympic champion, that's hardly a, a step up. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's get, um, oh, you like it? Uh, this will be room tone for uh, in St. Clair born interview on the Great Depression, uh, 1001.